Uh, well, uh, uh, thanks a lot uh, for that excellent introduction. Uh, I listened carefully. Um, I, I think people giving an introduction to a conference don't expect anybody to listen, but I actually listened carefully. And it was a rare philosophical talk because as far as I can tell, I agreed with everything he said about philosophy. That almost never happens uh, to me, so I'm very impressed. Um, <clears throat> now, also, I want to thank the organizers uh, for all the work that goes into organizing this conference and, and especially for inviting me. And above all, I want to thank everybody uh, for being willing to listen to a lecture in a language that for many of you is not your own first language. Uh, I could never do it myself, but I'm very glad that other people are willing uh, to listen to a lecture in English, because that's what you're going to get from me, <clears throat> uh, being, in effect, resolutely uh, monolingual. I have lectured in other languages, but uh, generally to the pain of everybody involved. Okay, uh, normally <clears throat> at a conference like this, uh, the speakers don't take the theme very seriously. Uh, prospects for a new realism, uh, they talk about whatever they happen to be interested in at the moment. And if it's got anything to do with the prospects for a new realism, well, so much the better, but so much the worse if, if it doesn't. Uh, I, in fact, <clears throat> intend to address uh, the actual <clears throat> uh, subject implicit in the title. And I take it uh, from Marcus's introduction uh, that the sense of realism that we're talking now is a, is a descendant of the traditional medieval uh, uh, sense, but it's now uh, the notion of realism is opposed not so much to nominalism, <clears throat> but to various forms of anti-realism, and in particular, uh, the, the entire idealistic uh, tradition or uh, pragmatism and instrumentalism. The basic idea, the basic intuition behind realism is that uh, there exists a reality uh, that is totally independent of our representations of it. And that has enormous consequences because, among other consequences, it uh, lends support to the idea of some sort of correspondence conception of truth. If there's a reality out there, then our representations of it are, at least in some respects, answerable to that reality, and they will be true or false depending on whether or not they succeed in meeting that requirement. Now, <clears throat> I need to situate the discussion I'm going to give you in the present intellectual context, and the central intellectual fact about the present era is that knowledge grows. Uh, the, um, the increase in knowledge uh, that we have had uh, over the past few centuries, but in particular over the past century, is absolutely stunning. I often wonder what it would be like to take Descartes or Leibniz into a university bookstore and just show them textbooks on molecular biology, or for that matter, civil engineering. Uh, there's a stunning increase in knowledge, and that places uh, our philosophical investigation in a somewhat different situation from the tradition. For 300 years, the dominant question in philosophy was epistemic, as Locke put it, uh, the nature and extent of human knowledge, and as Descartes put it more pressingly, how can we answer the skeptic? Now, I think that in a way that in the 17th century it was possible to take skepticism seriously as a real threat, I think we can no longer, we no longer take it seriously as a real threat. There are interesting philosophical puzzles about how we know we're not brains in vats or deceived by evil demons, but I think to put it very bluntly, you can't send men to the moon and back and then wonder, does reality really exist out there? Is there anything independent? You can't send men to the moon and back and wonder if it's really possible uh, to make uh, secure predictions about the future based on inductive reasoning. So uh, it isn't that we have resolved the, the, the questions of traditional epistemology, but they're no longer gripping to us in a way that they were. Well, what has replaced the epistemic skepti a skeptical problem then as the central problem in philosophy? Well, when I was an undergraduate, that would have had an easy answer. We were all obsessed with language. Uh, and uh, for a, a rather complex reasons that I won't have time to go into, 
we've evolved beyond that. We no longer have quite the obsession with language, but we have a kind of sensitivity to the philosophical uh, nuances and, and threats posed by language that uh, not, all, uh, not all of our forebears had. What has replaced the obsession with language as a central question? Well, a number of questions have replaced it, but the one I want to face is this. Given that we have now a remarkable extension of human knowledge, particularly in the form of um, atomic physics, uh, uh, chemistry, both organic and inorganic, uh, and the natural sciences generally, given this remarkable extension of knowledge, uh, there is a quite pressing philosophical problem, and I want to say it's the central problem of uh, philosophy today. In a way, it's the central problem of intellectual life today. It's a problem that's so vast, uh, we, in effect, unconsciously try to prevent our students from understanding that we really don't know how to, an how to answer the problem or even how to pose it, but here is a crude way to pose it. The knowledge that I described tells us that reality is ultimately a matter of entities that we call physical particles. They're not really particles, but it, that's a useful shorthand. Uh, that the world is made up of the entities described by atomic physics, and in some sense, all of reality has to be a matter of aspects of the basic facts, of the basic facts of physics and chemistry. But now we've got a problem uh, because there's a tension. There's a tension between the facts of physics and chemistry and our self-conception. Our self, the facts of physics and chemistry tell us that these particles, that the universe is made entirely of mindless, meaningless physical particles. And yet we think of ourselves as conscious, as having rationality, intentionality. We think of us as moral, as performing speech acts, as having free will, as capable of uh, aesthetic uh, creation and artistic judgment. Now we can pose the central question in a more pressing vein, and that is how do we reconcile our self-conception as mindful, conscious, free, rational, social, language-speaking agents? How do we reconcile that picture with the picture of reality as consisting entirely of mindless, meaningless, physical particles? Now, that, I think, is the problem uh, 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 posed for the new realism. And I say, I want to say a constraint on addressing that problem is not just realism, but what I will call naturalism. Uh, the idea that we're discussing natural phenomena, phenomena that are part of the real world. On the conception that I will be putting forward, uh, if there were such a thing as the supernatural, that would be part of nature like anything else. Uh, if God really existed, that would be a fact of physics like anything else. There couldn't be a supernatural, for if there were, it would be part of nature like anything else. Okay, but if that's our question, how to give an account of reality that shows how, not just how our self-conception is consistent with uh, what we know about the world from physics and chemistry, but in some sense it's a natural development from. It isn't just that we've got to show uh, that our social reality uh, is possible given a world of basic facts, but rather that it's a natural extension of the world of basic facts. We've got to show how you can get from uh, electrons to elections and from protons to presidents. And we know that, uh, that uh, you have to do that because it happens. Uh, that is, uh, for example, if you're going to have an election, uh, you better have enough electrons. Uh, nobody brings the electrons. You can't have an election, uh, to put it uh, very crudely. Uh, okay, now again you might say, well, let's just get busy and solve the problem uh, that I have posed. And that's what I'm going to start doing in a very uh, cursory fashion. But I have to say there are certain enormous intellectual obstacles that we face. And in, for the most part, these obstacles de derive from our 
remarkable philosophical tradition, and I have to mention a few of those before I make my positive suggestions. Well, the first obstacle we face is that somehow or other, there's something especially problematic about the mental. The mind cannot be part of the physical world. Uh, you all know the name of that view. Traditionally, it's dualism. But I want to say the traditional opposition to dualism, monism, materialism, behaviorism, uh, they inherit the worst mistake of dualism. Uh, the idea that somehow or other there's something problematic about the mental naively construed. Uh, one of the worst uh, <clears throat> expressions of this confusion is in something called artificial intelligence, or what I call uh, strong artificial intelligence. Uh, I think you can't understand the project of strong AI unless you see that they don't think of the mind as part of the natural world like digestion, as one of them, Dan Dennett, said. Uh, it, it, the mind is something formal and abstract. Well, you can't get more Cartesian than that. There's nothing formal or abstract about digestion of photosynthesis and the secretion of bile, and that's how we ought to think of the mental. So that's one of our curses, is the curse, to put it crudely, of God, the soul, and immortality. If you start off with your conception of mind as deriving from the conception of God, the soul, and immortality, then you will never get a naturalistic uh, account of the mental of the sort that I'm going to advocate. Now, I used to think that was our main uh, obstacle, is the, the, uh, the refusal to see the mind as a natural part of the world. Uh, but there are a couple of other sources of mistakes. Uh, just as we live uh, under the shadow of God, the soul, and immortality, so we live in the shadow of a certain conception of science. And people mistakenly suppose that science is the name of a set of propositions, of a set of uh, actual tentative, uh, what are in fact the actual tentative results of scientific investigation at any stage of human history. And on that conception that they have of science, it is, as they sometimes like to say, thoroughly materialistic and reductionist. Uh, so on this conception of science, uh, there would be no place uh, for uh, the mental naively construed, uh, for consciousness and intentionality as I construe them. And indeed, if you look at most contemporary philosophers when they engage in something they like to call naturalizing consciousness or naturalizing intentionality, it almost always means denying the existence of consciousness and intentionality as showing uh, that they're really something else. As Jerry Fodor once put it, uh, if intentionality really exists, it must be something else. And the answer to that is it does really exist, and it's not something else uh, for reasons that I'm going to try to tell you in a few moments. So we've got these twin uh, curses of God, the soul, and immortality on the one hand, and a misconception of science as a, as a as, so to speak, an alternative dogma on the other hand. And we've got to crawl out. From, I'm going to mix this metaphor here slightly. We've got to crawl out from under these uh, two heavy burdens that we've been uh, carrying. Uh, and the, in the account that I'm going to give you, we have to resist any form of postulating that there are alternative realities. Uh, the dualism was one uh, horrendous mistake that we still have not fully escaped. But it came out in even worse form uh, in the views of, well, for example, uh, Popper and Habermas, that no, there are really three worlds out there. There's the world of the physical, the world of the mental, and then there is the world, as one uh, author put it, of the social, of the cultural, in all of its manifestations. And I want to say, echoing my title here, no, uh, as my uh, colleague Donald Davidson uh, liked to put it, we live in one world at most. And that's the world uh, that we need to describe. Well, okay, then let's just get uh, busy and do it. Well, I said we have this, uh, uh, we, we live under the curse of God, the soul, and immortality, but also we live under the influence of a certain conception of 
perception. Of, perceptions are, along with action, is our basic way of relating to the world. So you can't get going in philosophy if you have a false theory of perception. And I think it's not much of an exaggeration to say that philosophy over the past three centuries has suffered from a mistaken theory of perception. Uh, and the people who make the mistake, well, the names are rather familiar. Descartes, Leibniz, Locke, Berkeley, Hume, uh, Kant, uh, and I, I, I could keep going, uh, certainly uh, Mill and Hegel right up through positivism. What's the mistake? Uh, this is a, a, a philosopher's gem because it's a simple fallacy and it's repeated over and over in the history of this subject. I wish I had a blackboard, but anyway, imagine I did. Here's what I would write down. There's a famous argument, and here's how it goes. <clears throat> Whatever it is I'm now seeing, let's suppose I say I now see my watch. Uh, well, I could be having a hallucination that was indiscriminable from this case. And fill in your favorite hallucinatory story. We could be deceived by an evil demon or brain, wear brains in vats, whatever. The point is I could have exactly this experience and it still be hallucination. But now in the hallucinatory case, I'm aware of something. I mean, there's something in my awareness. I'm surely aware of something. It isn't just empty, uh, my experience. But since the two experiences are indiscriminable, they're qualitatively identical, that's uh, by hypothesis, then whatever I'm aware of in the veridical case, it must be exactly the same as what I'm aware of in the hallucination case because the two cases are indiscriminable. But in the hallucination case, I'm not aware of anything in the real world. I'm aware of an idea, an impression, or sense data, or whatever term you want to use to describe it. Therefore, it turns out, we're never directly aware of the real world and perception. We're always aware only of our own experiences. And we're then often running with traditional epistemology. And I have now, uh, I've been going through a lot of these old arguments. They all make the, the following fallacy. In the example I gave you, we're aware of something in the veridical case and we're aware of, aware of something in the hallucinatory case, but it must be the same thing in the two cases. There's a fallacy of ambiguity over the expression aware of. The sense in which I'm aware of my watch when I see it is an intentionalistic sense. The watch is the object of my awareness. The sense in which I'm aware of something in the hallucinatory case is not an intentionalistic sense because the awareness and the object of the awareness are identical. The awareness in the case of the hallucination just is an awareness of the experience. It, it, awareness of then just picks an internal accusative where the awareness, the thing you're aware of is the awareness itself. You can see this with a very simple example. Push your arm, push your hand against the table. You're aware of the table. You're also aware of a painful sensation in your hand if you push hard enough. So it looks like what? That you, well, really you're only aware of the painful sensation in your hand or you're aware really of two things. There's a, there's a fallacy of ambiguity in aware of. Aware of has two senses. In the intentionalistic sense, the thing you're aware of is not identical with the awareness. In the constitutive or identity sense, the thing that you're aware of is the awareness itself, is the sensation itself when you push your hand against the table. Now, it might seem odd that so much philosophy should be based on such a simple fallacy, uh, but I've been through a lot of these guys and that I find the fallacy over and over and over, and in fact, it's repeated in modern science, where the temptation is to think, well, all we're really aware of when we see anything is what ha actually happens in the cortex when the neuron firings finally produce a visual experience. So roughly speaking, from Descartes to Francis Crick, we find the same fallacy repeated over and over. Uh, and it is a, a, it's a, a, a beauty for philosophers because it's a clear and identifiable fallacy, that rare thing. It's a fallacy of ambiguity. Uh, in the occurrence of the expression aware of, and it, uh, the, the fallacy is revealed in all the, of the, uh, at least all that I've been able to find, all of the traditional arguments. 
Hume thought a realistic theory of perception was so stupid that he only bothered to refute it in one sentence. He said, if you're tempted to realism, to naive or direct realism, push your eyeball. Uh, the world would double if naive realism were true, so it's not true. That's the fallacy I've been talking about. The world doesn't double when I push my eyeball. What actually happens is that I then have two visual experiences where I used to have one visual experience before. Anyway, I'm tempted to give you the whole lecture about this fallacy because it's everywhere you turn around. Uh, there's a, uh, a mistaken theory of perception uh, called disjunctivism. I hope it hasn't spread to bun because it's all over the streets of Berkeley. Um, uh, but it uh, commits the same fallacy. The idea is that if you think that you can actually, uh, that there's something in common between the hallucination and the veridical case, then what is in common has to be the object perceived. So it's the, it turns the traditional argument on its head. Uh, the, the, the traditional argument says, well, all you do perceive are the contents of your own mind. Uh, and the disjunctivist says, well, if you don't accept disjunctivism, you would have to accept that all you do perceive are the contents of your own mind. Both make the same mistake. Okay, now I want to assume we've overcome those mistakes, that we have naive realism as a theory, or some kind of direct realism as our theory of perception, and we're out from under the burden of God, the soul, and immortality, and a certain conception of science. Where do we go? Well, actually, I think many, not all, but many of the philosophical problems have relatively easy and fairly natural, if not solutions, at least approaches to the problem that will give us a correct conception of the relations. So let's just go through several of these problems. Well, let's start with the famous mind-body problem. How can it be the case? I said the world consists entirely of physical particles. By the way, I'm embarrassed to say that. They're not really particles. And there is a, a, a more acute embarrassment that I should mention, at least in passing. The latest version of physics that I get in Berkeley is that our old friends, uh, the atoms and the molecules, and I loved physics when they were electrons, protons, and neutrons, but now, God knows, with all the quarks and muons and so on, it's less fun. Uh, but that's, you know, that's what I'm paying those guys to do. But it turns out that that cheerful, friendly world, that's only about 4% of reality. And what's the rest? Well, the other 96% is dark energy and dark matter. Oh, yeah? And what's dark about them? What's dark about them is we don't know what the hell is going on in there. The darkness is a, is a, uh, is a matter of our cognitive state, and not a feature of the physics we're describing. But anyway, I'm going to assume uh, that we're... we're that whatever is going on there, it's the same kind of stuff as goes on in physics as traditionally conceived. Uh, okay, now if that's right, then how do we situate consciousness and intentionality within this picture? And I think once you accept a completely naturalistic view, uh, uh, and you accept the real, a, a realistic conception of the mental, of consciousness and intentionality, then it's not all that hard. Uh, if Try to imagine what it would be like if we had no philosophical tradition, if we had the kind of knowledge of how the world works that we have anyway, but we had no great tradition on the one hand of God, the soul, and immortality, and no great tradition on the other hand <laughs> Uh, of supposing that science must be reductionist and materialistic, uh, then it seems to me there's a fairly obvious solution to the philosophical parts of the so-called mind-body problem, and that is mental states are the two great features of mental states, consciousness and intentionality. They're real. They're real natural phenomena. They're as real as any other biological phenomena. And they are entirely caused by neurobiological processes. We don't know the details, but we're making a lot of progress. We now know a whole lot more about the brain uh, than, we, uh, than uh, we did when I first got interested in this. Uh, just the sheer uh, volume of knowledge that we have. When I first got interested in the brain, there were about five known neurotransmitters. Uh, and now they're over 50 and still counting. Uh, so we now know a lot more about the brain, but whatever we know, we know that all of our conscious states and all of our intentional 
processes are caused by neurobiological processes. But that doesn't solve our, um, our ontological problem. Uh, where are they? What's going on? And there I want to say the answer to that is equally simple. They are realized in the brain as higher level features. Uh, just as the liquidity of this glass of water is not something squirted out by the H2 mole H2O molecules, but rather is a state that the molecules are in. It's causally explained by the behavior of the molecules. So the consciousness present in my brain right now is, is not an extra juice squirted out by the neurons, but it's a state that the brain is in, and it's causally explained by the behavior of the neurons. I, uh, philosophers like labels. I was once asked, what's the name of your view? My God, I didn't have a name. Uh, so I thought of one on the spot. I said, it's biological naturalism. Well, okay, I'm sort of stuck with that. But anyway, uh, that's the view uh, that I'm uh, putting forward. Now, grant me then that we do have a reality of the mental and that it's part of nature. It's part of biology. Uh, there's uh, nothing in it uh, that is reminiscent of our of the dualistic tradition that postulates somehow or other that Geist must, cannot be part of the ordinary physical world. Uh, grant me that, then it's not all that hard to see how if you've got creatures that have intentionality, they have this capacity uh, for beliefs and desires and hopes and fears and intentions and uh, perceptions, they have those capacities then it seems to me it's not hard to see how they can get collective intentionality, how you can have shared uh, intentions and even shared beliefs and shared desires where you're engaged in an activity, not just I am doing this, but I am doing this as part of our doing this. You have collective intentionality. Now once you have intentionality and collective intentionality, you're off and running uh, with a with a possibility of a much richer ontology than you would have without that. However, lots of animals have both of those features. They have uh, in, intentionality and consciousness on the one hand, and they have the capacity to share that on the other. What's special about human beings? Well, one of the things that's special is that human beings have language. So the next great task. Uh, that we have to account for in philosophy is how do you get from this raw pre-linguistic uh, mental life to the richness of natural human languages. And here I'm going to be rather brief, but I do want to tell you the broad outlines. The key to understanding intentionality is that intentional states have conditions under which they're satisfied or not satisfied, what I call conditions of satisfaction. What stands to the beliefs being true is what stands to the desires being satisfied is what stands to the intentions being carried out. Think of intentionality as the representation of conditions of satisfaction. I think of perceptual int intentionality as a special kind of case where you have a direct presentation of the conditions of satisfaction. It's not a matter of shuffling representations. Well, if that's right, then if you ask yourself, well, how do you get linguistic meaning in a world of, uh, that has a rich neurobiology along with these structures of intentionality, including uh, um, the collective intentionality, then I think the answer is fairly simple, at least in its, in its uh, broad outline, and it's this. If you ask yourself, what's the difference between saying something and meaning it and saying it without meaning it, I think there is a, a simple answer to that. Wittgenstein, by the way, used to ask us questions like that because he uh, wanted us to get out of the idea that, that meaning was the name of an introspective process. But there is a difference between saying something and meaning it and saying it without meaning it. Uh, suppose I say es regnet as a matter of practicing German pronunciation. I say it, but don't mean it. I'm practicing it in the shower, we'll say. Uh, but now if I actually go outdoors and I say, es regnet, and I really mean it, then there's a difference. What's the difference? The utterance with a meaning has conditions of satisfaction, which the just practicing the pronunciation does not have. 
The condition of satisfaction of saying es regnet without meaning it is just that I correctly pronounce the German words. But if I say it and mean it, then the correct, the, the utterance with the correct pronunciation of the words now has additional conditions of satisfaction. Namely, it should be raining. So, and I think this is, a, in its simple form, is a key to understanding meaning. Speaker meaning, the fundamental form of meaning, is the intentional imposition of conditions of satisfaction on conditions of satisfaction. You make the sounds through your mouth, and that's intentional. So the production of the sounds is itself the condition of satisfaction of your intention to produce them, but the production of the sounds now has conditions of satisfaction on, built onto those conditions of sa satisfaction, namely that they should correspond to something in the world uh, in one of the other, one of the various possible directions of fit. So uh, that gives us the, the first step in the analysis of language. Now you've got to be able to communicate those meanings to other people. And the next crucial element we need is the notion of convention. The notion of convention is the notion of a procedure that you can follow. You make the noises that other people in your tribe have a right to expect will only be uttered under certain conditions. That is only uh, under conditions uh, when the conditions of satisfaction are in fact satisfied. They have a right to expect that you will be speaking truly. So you get meaning and convention and that enables you to communicate meanings because the conventions are shared. Now the next thing you need in your account of language, and this is a stunning development, it changes everything, and that is internal structure. And it, the marvelous thing about human languages, you see there are all sorts of other signaling systems among animals, the bees are probably the best understood. They have nothing like the internal structure of the syntax of natural languages. You have a structure when you can make the distinction <laughs> between uh, the reference of the noun phrase and the condition specified by the verb phrase. Uh, my dog, uh, Tarski, is a very intelligent dog. He's a Bena Zenenhund. I mean, he looks, he, he, he looks like a sincere dog, and he's very intelligent. Uh, and he can believe that someone is at the door. Uh, but he, he can't believe, well, maybe there are 17 people at the door. Or wouldn't it be nice if people came to the door next week? Or, by the way, have you done your income tax on time this year? He can't think any of those thoughts, uh, not because he's too stupid. He's actually pretty intelligent. But he does not have the internal syntactical resources uh, for those sorts of thoughts. So syntax literally gives us the capacity for an infinite number of thoughts, for an infinite number of thoughts in a way that animals lacking an inner syntax uh, do not have that capacity. The dog can think there's somebody at the door, but he, he cannot think, I wish there were a whole lot more people at the door and I hope we get more people coming to the door next week. To have those thoughts, you've got to have a richer syntax than he has. Okay, so now we've got, uh, I mean, and I apologize for the brevity, but I have only a very short uh, space of time. Uh, uh, we've got these biological beasts, namely ourselves, we're running around, uh, presumably uh, when we're getting this stuff in its primitive form, we're running around in northern Europe, perhaps not far from here, and we, we've got consciousness and intentionality which we share with, with uh, lower animals, uh, but also we've got meaning, convention, and syntax, and that gives us an enormous power. Now the power is not just the power to communicate, to communicate complex thoughts, but it gives us the power to create a kind of reality that other animals do not have, and I want now to say something about that. Typically, speech acts represent reality uh, in one or uh, the other of the most famous directions of fit. The aim of statements like perception is to represent how things are. They have what I call the mind to world direction of fit. The contents of the mind are supposed to fit reality and to the extent that they do we say they're true or false. The test for the mind to world direction of fit, the simplest test is can you say literally that it's true or false. The upward direction of fit which you get with 
um, commissives and directives with promises, vows, threats, and, and pledges on the one hand, and orders, commands, and requests on the other. Uh, there, the aim there is not to represent how things are, but to change reality by getting reality to match the content of the Speech Act, to match the content of the representation. They have the world-to-word -word direction of fit. But now here's an amazing fact, and I don't know of any uh, communication system other than the human that has this, and that is that we have a capacity to create a reality by representing that reality as existing. Uh, the most famous examples of these <clears throat> were in Austin's uh, discussion of performatives, where you can make something the case by saying that is the case. Uh, the chairman can adjourn the meeting by saying the meeting is adjourned. Uh, war can be declared by the appropriate authorities saying war is declared. And you can even perform other speech acts by declaring yourself to be performing them. You can make a promise by saying, I promise. These speech acts have both directions of fit. They make something the case by representing it as being the case. They make it the case and thus achieve the upward or world to mind direction of fit. But they change reality. They bring it about that change by representing reality as having been so changed. They make it the case that war is on, that you are husband and wife, uh, that uh, you have received a piece of property, that Barack Obama is the president of the United States, that I'm a professor at the University of California in Berkeley. All of those facts are created by speech acts that have this form. And I have a name for those, I call them declarations. Human institutional civilization is created entirely by a certain class of declarations where you make something the case by representing it as being the case. But now, how come you can do so much with such a feeble apparatus? What sort of fact do we create? And here we get an interesting hybrid uh, between realism and constructivism. It's really the case <clears throat> that I am a professor and that these bits of paper in my wallet are uh, euros uh, used as currency in the European, in the signers of the European uh, community. <clears throat> that those really are epistemically objective facts, but they're only facts by human agreement. They're facts, be it's really, it's a 50 euro note, not because of some feature of the physics, but because we have accepted that it is, and that acceptation, <laughs> that fact is created by a declaration, and it's maintained in its continued existence by representations that have the form of a declaration. How can such a thing be? Well, here I have to introduce a crucial notion, the notion of a status function. Uh, humans have a capacity <clears throat> to impose functions on objects. So this object, my watch, has a function, and, and this uh, uh, glass uh, carrying water has another, and this, my wallet, has a function. But humans, uh, lots of animals also have that capacity to impose functions on objects. But humans have a remarkable capacity, and as far as I know, it's not shared by any other species. And that is, there are a class of functions where the function is performed not in virtue of the physical structure of the entity in question. You see, these uh, entities perform their function in virtue of their physical structure. The function is performed not in virtue of the physical structure, but in virtue of the fact that through collective intentionality, we have assigned a status to the person or the object. The status of being money, or the status of being president of the United States, or the status of being the University of Bonn. And with that status goes a function or set of functions which can only be performed in virtue of the collective acceptance of the object or person as having that status, and with that acceptance, the acceptance of the functions that go along with that. So the remarkable thing about human civilization, and I want to keep reminding you, this is intended as completely realistic in the sense that I described, and it's completely ob objective epistemically. It isn't just my opinion uh, that this is money. It really is money. But it's a natural consequence of our biological structure 
given language. We create a reality, and this is the reality of human civilization. We create a reality of money, property, government, marriage, universities, cocktail parties, uh, income tax, and philosophical conferences. All of those are created by repeated applications of representations that have the logical form that I described, and I call them status function declarations. Now, not all declarations are status function declarations. When God, if he had existed, said, let there be light, uh, that was a declaration. He's not saying, Sam, over there, turn on the lights. It's not a directive. It's not a promise. He, doesn't, he isn't saying, I'll, I'll make light for you guys when I get around to it. He's making it the case that there is light by representing it as being the case. Now, we can't do that. We can't create light uh, just by declaring light to exist, but we can create governments, money, property, marriages, uh, universities, and all the rest of the phenomena that are peculiar to human civilization. We do those by representations that have this logical structure, where you make something the case by representing it as being the case. Now, what's the point of doing that? I mean, isn't it all a kind of massive fantasy? Uh, and the answer is, it creates power. And you are, throughout your uh, life, uh, you are immersed in a sea of status functions. You are a professor or a student, you're a husband or a wife, you are a, a, a citizen of a, a, a Germany and the owner of a car and the possessor of a driver's license. All of those are status functions. We create these power relations. But what kind of power is that where status functions can create power? And that power has various names in English. In English, they are obligations, rights, duties, uh, responsibilities, um, uh, uh, authorizations, uh, etc. That is, there's a list of the kind of powers that you can create using this apparatus that I've described. Now, the interesting thing is this. If you say, well, well, all right, you've created these power relations, but how does it work? I mean, what... Uh, uh, how does this give any grip on rationality? How does it motivate behavior? And the answer is, again, going the next step, human civilization has a remarkable feature uh, that other forms of animal life do not have, and that is we create a set of power relations that give people reasons for acting that are independent of their immediate inclinations. They're what I call desire-independent reasons for acting. And that's what status functions do. If you accept that's, that you have an obligation or that somebody else has a right, then you accept that you have a reason for doing something that's independent of your immediate inclination. And this is what gives human institutional reality its enormous power. Uh, a nice person invites me uh, to give a talk in Bonn, and it seems like a good idea, so I say yes. Uh, but then the day arrives, and I gotta get up at four in the morning and make my way to San Francisco airport and do all the sordid things that one has to do nowadays. In the United States, you even gotta take your damn shoes off. I won't go through the sordidness. Uh, well, you're all familiar with the sordidness of air travel. Uh, and I don't think, oh boy, how much fun uh, uh, to sit in an airplane seat for endless hours uh, and eat airplane food and have to try to put my elbow where some guy is trying to put his air elbow and all the other things. But I do it. I do it. Why? Well, I made a promise. I, I, I made a promise to do it, and that gave me a reason for doing it, and now I'm glad I did it. Uh, however, let me just uh, conclude. Uh, what, I, what I've are urged is this. <clears throat> if we can just get out from under our horrendously bad uh, tradition, uh, if we can get out from under the mistake that I have described as the foundational mistake of modern epistemology, and if we can get out un from under the mistakes that go with that, uh, the twin mistakes of religion and science, both, I think, misconceived, 
I, I, and those mistakes are not trivial mistakes. I mean, they're names to repeat are Descartes, Leibniz, uh, Spinoza, Kant, Locke, Barclay, Hume, not to mention Mill and Hegel and others uh, known better. I mean, uh, we'd have to throw in Schopenhauer, I'm sure. Uh, I, and if we can get out from under those mistakes, uh, then there's a possibility of doing a type of philosophy which I think is much more productive than occurred uh, in the past. I have only mentioned three features of this type of philosophy, and they are mind, language, and society. Uh, they're rather important features, but I think the approach that I'm advocating would also be the right approach to take to uh, ethics uh, and aesthetics uh, and political philosophy and lots of other branches of philosophy. So the general message that I want to leave you with is, as I said, we live in one world and one of the, the most single fascinating question of philosophy today is how can we give an account of ourselves as rational agents in that one physical so-called world. Thank you very much.